news. We continue to watch events unravel in the Middle East this week as America is showing more impotence and Russia is pushing itself forward. Several news stations in the United States have been reacting with horror to the lame duck policies of President Obama when it comes to dealing with President Putin of Russia. Many believe Obama has fumbled the Middle East ball for the American team, while Putin has intercepted and picked it up for the Russian. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters was interviewed on the Lou Dobbs Tonight program where he discussed Putin's end run on Obama. Joining us now, Fox News strategic analyst, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters. Ralph, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, let's turn first to what I, I really believe is a formidable, if not historic, geopolitical military maneuver by Vladimir Putin. He is attacking NATO politically. Uh, he has moved militarily against Ukraine and Crimea. He has positioned himself in such a way as to expand his influence throughout the Middle East and re-insinuate himself into the European discussion. Uh, your thought? You just said it. I mean, Vladimir Putin, he may be vulgar, he may be crude, but he is brilliant. And Western elites just underestimate him consistently because he didn't go to the right prep school. But the Paris attacks, Lou, were a gift of Vladimir Putin. Notice right after that, he suddenly was able to come out and say, yes, it was a bomb that blew up our airliner. Before that, he was hesitant because it would have reflected on a Syria policy. After the Paris, the Paris attacks, he could say, see, it's an attack on all civilization. We must stand together in solidarity. He also was brilliant with how he reached out to France quickly with serious military offers. Whereas the United States, we gave them some old targets right. that we were reluctant to hit because of collateral damage, et cetera. I mean, President Hollande of France asked the United States, he asked President Obama to help France. So let's get all, all, let's all get on the team. And Obama's response was that dreadful presser Monday morning in, in Antalya, Turkey. What did Putin do? Putin has now sent in his strategic bombers, the, the TU series bomber, Tupelo bombers. That's the equivalent of the U.S. sending Ralph, in B-52s. Ralph, there is the, the, the um, if you will, the optics of this. Olan will be at the White House, but already he is shoulder to shoulder with Putin on attacking the Islamic State in Syria and, and for all the world. People have to be scratching their heads at how suddenly the president of France and the president of Russia seem far closer than uh, certainly either with President Obama. Well, look, my sympathies were, the, were with President Hollande. If you're in a knife fight, who do you want to, to, to be on your team, a fighter or a faculty lounge philosopher like President Obama? I mean, it, it's a no brainer. I, France has been attacked. And President Obama dismissed 500, almost 500 uh, people uh, killed and wounded in, in France. And Obama says it's a setback. John Kerry basically says, well, at least Charlie Hebdo attack was justified. I mean, this is offensive. We managed to insult the French. Vladimir Putin is helping them. This is, as you said, a tremendous geostrategic uh, geo advance for Vladimir Putin. And, you know, who's, who's going to pay? The Ukrainians, they're being forgotten. Everyone else that's Putin's victimized. And Putin is, as you and I have discussed, Lou, he is on his way to incredible influence in the Middle East that, of a scale Russia's never had with this Shia Iranian empire being built out. And who are the losers? Ukrainians, Europeans, the Christians, who Obama apparently doesn't like, who are the true refugees. And you know who else? The United States of America and its citizens. So even the world is seeing this as a formidable, if not historic, geopolitical military maneuver. This maneuver isn't limited to France and Europe either. Earlier this week, Putin went to meet the Iranian president to shore up his support in the Middle East. On the same program, Lou Dobbs tonight, K.T. McFarland, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs under President Reagan, was interviewed and had the following to say. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad now says his troops are advancing on almost all fronts because of Russian airstrikes that started nearly two months ago. President Putin today is shoring up support for Assad in Iran. He met with the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini for more than an hour and a half. The Kremlin says both countries agreeing to oppose any, quote, 
external attempts at regime change in Syria. Wow. Let, let's turn very quickly to Putin in Tehran. Uh, basically, it, it was a cooperation agreement uh, between the, the government of Iran and, uh, and Russia, uh, excluding the United States and shoring up Bashar al-Assad. End of story, Mr. Obama. End of story, Mr. Obama, leading from behind. We've now been left behind in events in the Middle East. So Putin is now calling the shots. He's got an alliance with Russia, Iran, Iraq, and Assad. France is going to end up joining this alliance, too. Now, France had said Assad's got to go. They're not saying that anymore. They want Russian help in destroying ISIS. You know, but here, here's the problem. It was the president who said, we, are, we have contained ISIS, right? Mm -hmm. And then within a few hours, ISIS attacks in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, Secretary Kerry said, we've got Al-Qaeda on the ropes. Al-Qaeda attacks in Mali. You could go on and on and on. The point where now the president says, look, ISIS, it's just a bunch of weirdo computer hackers in the granny's basement uh, who are really good on social With media, while the rest of Europe's on lockdown. What do you expect from that meeting? He cannot, Nothing. Obama can't presume to replace uh, Russia in that alliance. Uh, he's foreclosed by Iran. He is inartful, and uh, his dodging is catching up with him. Well, and where is Hollande going after he meets with Obama? He's going to Moscow. He's meeting with Putin. He knows Putin is the guy who's making things happen in the Middle East. So following up from last week's Bible in the News, we see America's failure in the Middle East and Putin's successful move to trump the U.S. and park itself as the dominant and active player in the Middle East. Well, Friday also saw a memorial service in France to honor the fallen dead in a ceremony in the courtyard of the historic Les Invalides complex, the first time civilian dead have been honored in this military institution. The Associated Press reported a subdued France paid homage Friday to those killed two weeks ago in the attack that gripped Paris in fear and mourning, honoring each of the 130 dead by name as the president pledged to destroy the army of fanatics who claimed so many young lives, end quote. While Alain pledged France will operate relentlessly to protect its children. As was mentioned last week, Alain didn't invoke Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. Instead, he invoked the clause of the European Lisbon Treaty dealing with defense and called upon his fellow compatriots in Europe to join in. Well, the Guardian newspaper reported this week on the growing European resolve. It said a strong emphasis is being placed on rallying support from European states because, as the French president put it, ISIS didn't just strike at Paris, but at Europe as a whole. Building up a unified European resolve is especially important because no one is under any illusion that Obama administration wants to embroil itself deeper in the Middle East. America, miles across the Atlantic, simply doesn't feel its own security is on the line, but Europe's is. The Middle East is spewing out its violence on our continent. Germany has announced it will contribute surveillance and refueling planes over Syria. Well, this comes on the heel of a terrorist plot being covered in Germany. Ynet Daily reported, Israel reportedly helped thwart a terror attack in a German city of Hanover only days after the devastating attack on Paris, according to a story published on Wednesday in Germany's magazine Stern. Stern cites German government sources that said Israel provided crucial intelligence about an imminent terror attack targeting the friendly match between Germany and Holland's soccer teams. This led to the cancellation of the game and the evacuation of the stadium only 90 minutes before the game was to start. An hour after the stadium was evacuated, the terror alert was applied to the entire city and, pe and police called on residents to remain at home and avoid crowded places. Shortly after that, a suspected bomb was found at the train station of Hanover, and it too was evacuated. End quote. It is quite significant that Germany is being pulled into the conflict in the Middle East as an ally of France and consequently Russia. When we consider the grand coalition described in the Bible, it is a militarized one comprised of Russia, France, and Germany. We read in Ezekiel 38, verse 26, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, and the land of Magog, which is the area of Eastern Europe, including, including Eastern Germany, the prince of Rosh, or Russia, Meshech, or Moscow, and Tubal, which is Tobolsk, and prophesy against him. Later on we read Gomer, which is comprised of France and Germany, 
and all his bands at the house of Tagarmer of the North Quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Well, this coalition includes the nations from the land of Magog, which sits between the River Don and the River Danube, including what we used to call the Warsaw Pact, or Eastern Europe, and the tribes of Gomer, which we looked at last week, that include the areas of France and Germany. And this group is militarized, as we read in verse 4, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, Fields, all of them handling swords. Well, since the Second World War, Germany has taken a backseat to any military involvement. The Wall Street Journal stated this week, Germany, which has adopted a largely pacifist stance since the end of World War II, has been reluctant to intervene in the conflict in Syria thus far. Miss Merkel's move last year to send arms and military trainers to support Kurdish militants fighting the Islamic State in northern Iraq was widely viewed as the limit of what the public would support. However, the Paris attacks appear to have shaken parts of the German public out of its anti-war attitude, end quote. So Germany's largely pacifist stance since the end of World War II has to change according to the scriptures, and this is exactly what we've been seeing take place during this week. A Wall Street Journal article stated, Germany plans to send a warship and reconnaissance planes to support the fight against the Islamic State in Syria, senior government officials said Thursday, a move that shows the Paris attacks have forced one of Europe's least militaristic nations to reconsider its stance. The German government has today agreed on difficult but important and necessary steps, the defense minister told reporters after a meeting with lawmakers of the ruling coalition parties. We have jointly agreed on this this in the knowledge that we stand close alongside France, end quote. Well, while all this has been going on, the headlines were splattered with scenes of a Russian jet being downed by Turkish forces. The News of Europe reported, relations between Moscow and Ankara have plunged into a crisis since the incident on Tuesday. Turkey claims the jet had violated its airspace while flying over northern Syria. The Russian Su-24 fighter jet was sought, shot down on Tuesday morning by a Turkish F-16 jet after 10 warnings not to violate Turkish airspace, the Turkish military claimed. Russia vehemently denies it vi violated Ankara's airspace. The two pilots ejected from the plane, but one was killed while another was rescued several hours later. In retaliation for Turkey's actions, Russia prepared to impose punishing economic sanctions against Turkey, including abandoning a flagship pi pipeline project and a 20 billion nuclear power deal. End quote. Well, Reuters reported the following statement from Putin during a meeting with Jordan's King Hussein, where he stated, Today's loss is linked to a stab in the back delivered to us by accomplices of terrorists. I cannot qualify what happened today as anything else. And now we are stabbed in our back and our planes, which are fighting terrorism, are struck. This despite the fact that we signed an agreement with our American partners to warn each other about air-to-air -air incidents and Turkey announced it was allegedly fighting against terrorism as part of the U.S. coalition. End quote. But what is shocking is the impudence of Turkey after the attack. Rather than an apology or explanation, Turkey boastfully claimed responsibility. As Russia responds with sanctions and diplomatic measures, Turkey continues to threaten. Reuters reported on Friday, Turkish President Erd Erdogan warned Russia on Friday not to play with fire, citing reports Turkish businessmen had been detained in Russia while Moscow said it would suspend visa-free travel with Turkey. Russia has threatened economic retaliation, a response Erdogan has dismissed as emotional and indecorous, end quote. Well, the same article cited Russian politicians demanding a military response. Lower House Speaker Sergei Narashikin called the incident an international murder of its soldiers, saying Russia has the right to mount a military response, end quote. This is of great significance because of what the Bible prophets have to say. Turkey will be the impetus that triggers Russia's eventual invasion of the Middle East. Daniel describes the scene in Daniel 11 verse 40, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. 
The hymn mentioned in this passage is Turkey. This corresponds with the Ottoman Euphratean power of Revelation chapter 16, where we read in verse 12, The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Well, the four angels who had overflowed the Euphrates in Revelation chapter 9 included the nations who passed over the Euphratean River and brought judgment on the Byzantine Empire. These included Togrel Beg and the Seljuk Turks, Genghis Khan and the Mongols, Tamerlane and the Mughals, and the Ottoman Turks who overran the Byzantine capital and turned St. Sophia's, the St. Peter's Basilica of the Eastern Orthodox Church, into a mosque. The overflowing Euphratean powers would be dried up in preparation for the kingdom. The power of the Ottoman Turks was dried up in 1917 when the King of the South forces pushed the Ottoman Turks, driving them out of the Middle East under General Allenby and the infamous Lawrence of Arabia. Well, Daniel goes on to describe the coming invasion of the same power by Russia. The King of the North shall come against him, Turkey, like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Russia is to invade Turkey and to take back St. Sophia's that they have coveted since 19, or 1492, when the Muslims took it over on May the 29th. The Russian cross that domes the Kremlin churches anticipates the future victory of Christianity over Islam with the cross shown to conquer Islam. Well, following the invasion of Turkey, the king of the north would not stop, but would overflow and pass over. Stopping next in Israel, we read in verses 41 to 42, He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. And he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So the bellicose gobbling of Turkey inciting the Russian bear is of great significance when we look at Bible prophecy, and what the prophets tell us is still to take place. Well, much of the world stands in solidarity with Paris over the terrorist attacks, and Israel has its own kind of solidarity. In October, 74 Israelis were killed or wounded by terrorist attacks. In November, to date, 59 Israelis have been killed or wounded in terrorist attacks. There have been more separate incidents of terror in Israel than in any other country in the world in the past two months. So how does the world respond to terror in Israel following the Paris attacks? Well, Reuters reported on Wednesday, in a move dubbed surreal by a leading UN watchdog, and as a campaign of daily Palestinian terrorist attacks continues to target Israelis, the United Nations General Assembly on Tuesday adopted six resolutions, all of which, bar none, condemned Israel. Not a single mention was made of the Palestinian attacks, which have left 22 Israelis dead and hundreds wounded, nor did any other countries, even serial human rights violators such as Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, and others receive any of the General Assembly's attention. More disturbingly still, five of the United Nations General Assembly resolutions were sponsored by the Palestinian Authority, while the six was sponsored by none other than Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria. The article noted on the vote, One resolution condemned the Jewish state for retaining the Golan Heights, demanding Israel hand it over to the Syrian regime. The resolution's adoption by 105 votes to 6, with 56 abstentions, elicited war words of praise from Syria's UN ambassador, who expressed his heartfelt appreciation and gratitude to the UN for its Golan resolution, without any sense of irony, accused Israel of occupation-killing policies, expansion, racism, and aggression. Another vote, which passed 153 to 7, claimed that Israel has no right to impose its sovereignty over the holy city of Jerusalem. It's astonishing, said Neuer, that at a time when the Syrian regime is massacring its own people, how can the UN call for more people to be subjected to Assad's rule? The timing is morally galling and logically absurd. End quote. So while the world stands with Paris it still stands against Israel, God's chosen people. 
So as we see the nations preparing themselves for the great day of God Almighty, we need to prepare ourselves for the stealthy advent of the Lord Jesus Christ and the coming kingdom of God to be centered in Jerusalem when a real solution will be imposed on the nations of the world and peace will truly be achieved. For the Bible in the News, this has been Jonathan Bowen joining you.